And I remember, I remember vividly being in the car calling you the moment Iberflus got hired. My first comment to you was, he's a nice guy from a nice team, and he coached a bunch of nice players. And that means absolutely fucking dick in the NFL. I want to be honest and talk today. about this team. I brought this up to you week two of the preseason, yeah. right? So these are these are concerns that I've been addressing since like week two of the preseason. It's finally, it's come to fruition. Starting from Flus, I don't think this guy's a professional NFL head coach by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, he's a nice guy who's nice to his players and he's a player's coach. He, there, there is next to zero accountability in that. And you can be a nice guy and a nice head coach and be accountable. Lovey Smith did it. Tony Dungy did it. Rod Marinelli did it. These guys are nice people and they're good people. Does not necessarily mean that with the right group of people, they're going to be good head coaches. At the end of the day, accountability in the NFL is everything. Because these are grown fucking men with families and jobs and jobs to do. And at this point, the only thing Iberflus has held accountable is the players and nothing else. He has never held himself accountable. He's never held his offensive coordinators accountable, never held his defensive coordinators accountable. It's always just passing the buck and just, you know, hey, these are the, the way the things go. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, we fucked up and we're going to fix it. And that I think that's where it starts and ends with, with the coaching side of it. I think there's a lot more – systematic issues going on with the Chicago bears. And I, I've told you from the beginning and you've convinced me otherwise many times that sometimes ownership doesn't have to change just to change a team. But my belief before that, before you've convinced me is that it starts from the McCaskies and starts and goes down. There's a weird sense of lack of accountability and lack of ownership and lack ownership in the sense of I own my fuck ups. And that starts from the McCaskies down. And uh, we can continue to go on. I think Shane Waldron's a fucking fraud. I don't think this defense – I think this defense is going to be exhausted and frustrated by week six, week eight. I think you'll see some some stuff from the offense that you might like. But like you said, the, the, the key word, and every time you talk about a different subject, and I'm talking about the fans that you're talking about who predict 12 and 13 wins, the – coaching staff, the ownership, fucking arrogance. The word is arrogance. The walk around like you've already penciled in 12 fucking wins and you're this charter franchise and you have this accountability. The fucking arrogance of these people is making me sick to my stomach because if me and you know anything is we bust each other's balls and we call each other out all the time. And when you're wrong, you're wrong. And when you're right, you get to say you're right. Chase Claypool situation all over again. Like, especially when it comes to Nate Davis specifically, in my opinion. Nate Davis, the only time I'd let him play another snap in a Bears uniform is literally if he's the last healthy guard I have. I would give just about anybody else a shot there at this point based off what I'm seeing. Got to put this in a perspective. Typically, you get 8 to 10 offensive drives a game on a second down. To let pressure through and sack your quarterback for five, six, seven yards is a drive killer. It's one play, and, and it just gets shown as this one 10-second mess up that you could dissect and maybe explain what he's doing and this and that. You don't understand. That's 10% of your drives shot in the foot. You do that two, three times in the game, you've ruined like a third of, of the chances single-handedly. That's why these mistakes are critical, and they – the word unacceptable needs to be like double underlined. And then you need to hold the guys accountable for their mistakes. I mean, it is just, uh, it's a nightmare to sit there and just try and kick this dead horse, hoping it's just going to jump back up and start running around everywhere. Right, man. Uh, so I, I can't deal with the Nate Davis thing. I really can't. Uh, I don't care who you have in there. You need to figure that out. Another thing is, Kevin Jenkins played his worst game of the year last year when he got moved to left guard. Okay? Because you got Nate Davis, and he's a right guard, you've now permanently moved Kevin Jenkins to the left guard, where he hasn't had a good game really yet. If, if 
at all you knew what you were do you need at least half that line to be okay. I would definitely have Tevin Jenkins next to Darno Wright. Period. I don't care. Period. Point blank. Dude, like, again, arrogance. Arrogance comes to mind. Like the word arrogance, Paulie. And the arrogance of thinking that you know better. That Tevin Jenkins has moved three positions in four years at this point. And you're just like, yeah, we got this. We know exactly how to use him and where to use him. And who cares where he can play well. Like, But we know better. Because we got Nate Davis and Coleman Shelton. And you know what? Ryan Bates. Let's throw Ryan Bates in there. Because I, I failed on getting him like a year ago. So let's let's spend a pick that's almost the same as getting for Keenan Allen. You spent almost as much draft capital trading for Ryan Bates as you did for Keenan Allen. A bona fide Hall of Famer. This was not a travesty of a result. We said this. The numbers aren't really that interesting. Caleb played a pretty good game for one and one. But the eye test is going to tell you much more than you want to predict this year. Realistically, you should be 0-2. And there are very few 0-2 teams in this in this league right now. And most of them are absolute jokes and dumpster fires. You're in the bottom five of teams. You are. You're bottom five to bottom seven. You're in there with Carolina. Atlanta, you're in there with the New York Giants, these really badly organized run franchise. The starting center from Buffalo was released two days after the Bears traded for Ryan Bates. They knew Ryan Poles' obsession with Ryan Bates. They knew he wanted him. They got what they could for him as a fifth. Then they released Pro Bowler Mitch Morris two days later, and Mitch Morris signed as a completely free agent two days later because the Buffalo Bills were in contract hell. Ryan Bates has never, ever played an entire full season. That's great that you have this idea. What do you have to back it? At what point has Ryan Bates shown you anything towards him being the savior? Just got to let him get healthy. It's the same old thing. We just need more time. We just need more time. You just need to let this thing gel. You, We, we just need to consistency and this and that. And it's your tenant. If 25. Ryan Bates was the same, he'd 25. be on Buffalo. Your tenant there. If Ryan Bates was this good, he'd still be with Buffalo because he's a $3.8 million contract. You're 10 and 25 as a head coach. You look through the history of this league, there aren't many coaches that start 10 and 25 that wind up being good coaches. So the idea that this thing's going to magically turn around at some point, one is just historically that doesn't give you any kind of backing to to think it will. I have been one to not criticize Ryan Poles much, if at all. I've liked Ryan Poles and the moves he's made. And so it's hard for me to sit there and like those moves all along the way and then kind of turn on him. Ultimately, though, I think the one thing that's really going to hurt him is the fact that he just stood there and backed Matt Eberflus with no question during this last offseason. I mean, with no question, as if there aren't better coaches out there. You you had to replace your offensive and defensive coordinator. We we don't have an identity as as an offense in week two you're sitting there and i think ryan Poles did a good job at getting talent together you don't have the right guys in place to use that talent in any any correct way yeah no 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 no. sorry we expected the loss this is that's the this is not what this is about the the, what this is about and i'm going to speak for myself here is it is not that you're 0 and 2 or 1 and 1 or losing to 0 and 2. The Ravens are not freaking out. The Bengals are not freaking out. Because there they, are things there that result in wins that are infrastructural, that are a, a basis of, of of skill, of comp of like of competency. What we're talking about is you went one and one, losing to a Super Bowl favorite, and none of the problems that have come up in the first two weeks are fixable mid-season, much less after two games. So we're looking forward to 15 games. This isn't like you need a, a little bit of pass rush, so you go trade for Trey Hendrickson. You need an offensive weapon, so you go get a receiver at the trade deadline for a bad team. This isn't like 
okay, we need like a linebacker because we can't cover the middle. This is – you have zero depth at interior They're- offensive line, and it's been a problem for three fucking years. You have had bad coaching for three fucking years. You've completely ignored it, and it's rearing its ugly head again. We are hoping here a lot. We're hoping this gets better. We're hoping the quarterbacks – plays better we're hoping to get some wins we're hoping these that shane waldron's gonna somehow be some leader for this team and be this great offensive genius but a lot of teams have more confidence than just hope the only thing i'm confident about is i've seen this before i've seen it multiple times this is how you ruin a quarterback that's what I'm confident about. I'm confident that we're in the process right now of at a very, very, very early point in Caleb Williams' career, just straight up stunting him right away. And, man, the best way to do that is to let him go out there and just get his head bashed in. I mean, it is, that's what I'm confident about. Everything else is hope. When you look at the good teams in the league, they're not hoping. The Kansas City Chiefs aren't hoping. They're, they know. They know they're damn good. That's why when they face a team like us, they put they 45 to 10. That's what happens. It's just it's it's this comment. It's this comment that I look at that gets to me. And you, you know why it gets to me? Because it actually says everything. A Super Bowl favorite in their stadium. It's wild. Go back one year. And the Bears and the Texans were right here. 